Well, good morning. Looks like everybody's running a little late this morning, but we're going to go ahead and get started because the, the clock is an unrelenting taskmaster that uh, doesn't care if <laughs> people are late or not. So we're going to get started. We're, we're going to be looking at just a little three-week series because, again, I'm going to be gone in four weeks from now uh, for a couple of weeks to Romania. Well, no, it's three, three lessons, and then the fourth week I'll be, so you got an extra week, Sam. That is your time wisely, an extra week to be able to sleep. <laughs> so, uh, so, Steve, would you uh, open us sure. this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this morning, Lord, that you allow us one more day upon this earth, Lord, that we can come and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we just thank you for the ones that are here, Father. We pray for the ones that aren't. For whatever reason, Father, you know all. So I pray, God, that you will tend to their needs and, and their, uh, their situations that they find themselves in this morning. But Father, for us, Father, that are here, we pray, Lord, that you prepare our hearts, Father, that we can receive the message, Lord, from, from your word that uh, you gave to Harry, Father, to give it to us, that you prepare it, that you'll till it, and that it'll be a good, fertile ground so the seed can take hold. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for uh, this church, and I thank you, Lord, that uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the situation where people have moved and have settled in, and we just thank you, Lord, for even new neighbors that's just a mile away, and they know who I'm talking about. So, Father, I just pray, Lord, that that uh, that you be with me also, Father. That uh, that uh, you'll help me, Father, to not to fret or to worry, but uh, to lean on you, Father. That uh, this situation, Lord, that I find myself in, will pass, and that and that you're in control, so it wouldn't do any good anyway. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you, God, for for dying for me. We give you the praise and rest in my pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, we were in a, in a um, course in particular, we've been looking at a number of different books and going through kind of a books, various book studies. Then most recently, it was more of a historical thing on that road to Easter, still going through scripture, but looking and picking out some stuff. This is more of a topical thing, so I like to kind of mix things up a little bit, not just do just strict Bible studies or strict topical and kind of move things around. Um, the title of this series, as you can see on the screen, as you can see on your handouts, is Three Things Every Christian Should Do. Now, there are a lot more than just three things that every Christian should do, but what I wanted to do is give you just kind of three basic things here. And I've done it in a what's called a monomic style, and all three of them are starting with the letter E. Because if you do, I've learned, for my own life at least, if I have something that I can remember easily, i.e. three E's, um, that then I can help to remember things. Jesus famously said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Again, kind of showing that love is an action word. It's not a feeling, it's something that you do. If you love me, you will do this. That's, how, that's what love is, it's something that you do. He also listed the two greatest commandments in order when, of course, the, the legal guys were kind of trying to trip him up. In Mark 12, verses 29 to 31, they asked him, what's the most important one? And he said, this is the most important Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Lord, the lo Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment greater than these. So again, giving a thing to do centered around the idea of love. Our society, though in very subtle and sometimes very overt ways, constantly bombards our minds with the need to focus on 
ourselves. Showed up in advertising. You deserve a break today. You do you. Is you do you. I get to speak my truth, which is a phrase that just throws me. You have it your way. So very subtle ways, but also in very overt ways. Um, everything is focused on you, but God said that, Jesus said the two greatest commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your soul, your strength, your mind, your heart, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He took the focus completely off of you. Focusing on ourselves is, is actually pretty darn easy. And you'll know this because every time you look at a list of names, what's the first thing you look for? Yours. Yours. <laughs> yeah, my name on it. Over the next three weeks, we're going to look at three ways that we can love our fellow believers. I'm not even going to go with loving my neighbors outside of here because if I can't love the people in this room, if I can't love the people in that sanctuary, how am I going to love my neighbors who don't have that same connection with me? So I'm going to start really at the core before I, we ever move out from there. All this so that we can grow in what's called the image of Jesus, Romans 8, 29 and 30. Those three E's are exhort, that's today. Next week will be edify, and then we will end with encourage. Now, what you're going to see over this three weeks as well is that all three of these really are pieces of, the, of each other. You can't really take exhortation out all by itself, because you're going to see encouragement in there. Same thing with edify. Exhorting, you're going to end up edifying. Edifying, you're going to be exhorting. But I'm going to kind of take a look at three of these. And these are also kind of what I call church words. Because you don't hear the word exhort outside of church. Ever. I'm going to, I'm going to guess. I'm going to go way out on limb here and say the last time you, you used or heard the word exhort outside of church was probably never. <laughs> After Catherine said it in the movie she was in, John it does. She said, I'm an exhorter. It, it does. It, it, uh, uh, from time to time, but pretty darn, pretty darn rare. Good <laughs> I was looking at an article called "Thanks, um, Thanks for the Feedback: The Science and Art of Receiving Feedback Well." Mm -hmm. The writer and I forgot to write down the author's name, so I'm telling you, I didn't write this stuff. Um, we swim in an ocean of feedback. Each year in the United States, every school child will be handed back as many as 300 assignment papers and tests. 300. Feedback. Millions of kids will be assessed as they try out for a team or audition to be cast in a school play. Almost 2 million teenagers will receive SAT scores and face college verdicts, both thick and thin. Feedback, telling you something about yourself. At least 40 million people will be sizing up one another for love online. <laughs> where 71% of them think that they will be able to judge love at first swipe, sight and swipe left. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's the one, I can tell. Of course, now that we know each other, 250,000 weddings will be called off, and 877,000 spouses will file for divorce. More feedback awaits us at work. 12 million people will lose a job, and countless others will worry that they may be next. More than 500,000 entrepreneurs will open their doors for the very first time, balanced by another 600,000 that will shut their doors for the last time. Thousands of other businesses will struggle to get by as debates proliferate in the boardroom and in the back hall about why their business is struggling. 
feedback flies. And did I even mention the annual performance review? <laughs> Estimates suggest that between 50 and 90% of employees will receive performance reviews this year, upon which their raises, bonuses, promotions, and often their self-esteem is built. When I was in the police department, we of course we'd get our annual review and it changed a number of times over, over the almost 30 years I was on the force, but for a while it was a number system. And six was the highest. And then they got it. No, no, but you couldn't get a six. You could get a six in some areas. But, and my wife can attest to this, if I think that there's a level here to be achieved, And you better tell me why I didn't make it. <laughs> I, my wife will famously tell you the story of me getting a 97% on a, when I was in my master's course, on a test, and emailing the professor and arguing over a wrong answer. And arguing back and forth so much that the professor finally changed it and gave it Gave <laughs> two answers on it was a multiple choice, you know, thing. Still an A. I was still an A. <laughs> but feedback. A cumulative ninety-four thousand years are spent each year preparing for and engaging in <clears throat> annual reviews by managers. Feedback. Afterward, and of course, we end up feeling, and if you've ever been a manager and our boss and having to write annual performance reviews, you feel a thousand years older after you're done with that. So, with all of that feedback noise coming in, what about the Yelp reviews? Oh, Yelp review, all this stuff, feedback, feedback, feedback. It's just we, we are drowning in feedback. What are we supposed to do with each other? With all this information coming in about you, what are we supposed to do with each other? Be ye kind one to another. That would be nice. If we could just get there, that would be perfect. That, you said suppose, you didn't say what do we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, we're going to start with this idea of exhorting, exhortation. And as anybody that's been in my class for any time, anytime I give a new word, what's the first thing I always do? Define it. Absolutely, because I want all of us to understand the word the same way. Because otherwise I throw this word out there and then y'all leave and I get 15 different people with a different idea of what, what does that word mean? And you still will. What's that? And you still will. <laughs> yeah, I still will, but I, I'm trying to limit it down as much as I possibly can. So. Let's go with some definition here. Outside of a church setting, like I said earlier, you don't really hear this word exhort, exhortation, used in everyday life. So the Holman Bible Dictionary defines it as an argument or advice intended to incite hearers to action. That's what exhortation is. It's an argument or advice that its entire intent is to get somebody to get, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do something. Now, the term argument here <laughs> is not a back and forth disagreement. It is a well-reasoned and stated case for a position. Like an argument in court. I, I, this is, I, I've thought about it. Here's my reasoning for it. So a, an exhortation is this well-reasoned, idea that I'm sharing with you and whole idea is to get you to do something or maybe to not do something. So to exhort to someone is to give reasons or advice that will move them to a particular action. So we're all on the same page, right? Any questions so far? This is what exhortation is. So you'll see that there's a lot of exhortation that happens in a church setting. And there should be. Harry, I just keep thinking about, I'm flipping through Proverbs, there's so many places, is it 
in my head, I'm thinking about you know those who love discipline. You know, so it can be a good thing. It, it's a very good thing. Body, right? There's positives. Yes. There's also times when it, we need to exhort. Doesn't just mean rah rah. It can mean in a good, kind, loving way. Oh, absolutely. Hey, I've noticed this about you. I mean, I would hope my fellow church members would come to me if there was something, you know, going on. Yes. I needed to be approached with. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. That and the Book of Proverbs is almost an entire book of exhortation, trying to get the hearer to do something or to not do something. Excellent point. The Greek word here is. Parakleo, which is a compound word from two words, the first para to be near and kleo to call out. So this is a person to person thing. Yes. Exhorting is not a, you know, a big outside thing. It's a person to person thing. It's to get near somebody. In modern day vernacular, it's to get up in somebody's grill. Get up in somebody's face. See, I, I said grill and, and I saw a number of gray hairs like mine that said, like on the car? <laughs> um, so it's a right up front, person to person, in their face sort of thing. An example of this is a call to action, which can be seen in 1 Thessalonians 5.14. This is just one example here. That there, you know, there's a ton I could have picked up. We exhort you, brothers, warn those who are lazy, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. So, Paul there is exhorting his audience directly, and here's not one call to action, but four. Warn the idol. Hey, it's time for you to get up and get busy, son. Comfort the discouraged. Don't just say, oh man, I bet they're really hurting. <laughs> get in there and comfort the discouraged, which means that you're going to have to use your time and your effort. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. That's just one example out of Scripture of a very definite call to action. And this was a multiple call to action there to the church or to the young pastor there in, in the church of Thessalonica. So to begin with, exhortation is also listed as a spiritual gift. Romans 12, 6 through 8 has one of the various lists in here, and we'll see it here. Romans 12, verses 6 through 8. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the standard of faith. If service, in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhorting, in exhortation. Giving with generosity. Leading with diligence. Showing mercy with cheerfulness. And yeah, and with cheerfulness. Paul gives that short list there in Romans, but there is exhortation as one of the spiritual gifts. Now, the fact that this is a spiritual gift does not mean that if you don't have that particular spiritual gift that you're off the hook and don't have to do this. <laughs> well, I don't actually have that spiritual gift. I have the gift of prophecy, so... <laughs> I have the gift of giving, so I'm just going to fill up the offering plate and I'm not going to talk to anybody. It's not what it is. We know that this is fact and activity for all of us to be involved in, involved in with each other from verses like, and I've got three of them coming up here. First off, Romans 1, 11, and 12. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is... You and I may be mutually encouraged by each other. So, was there any talk about us using a spiritual gift there? That was kind of a general command to everybody. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 5 11. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Again, any particular 
person named there, that's a general group thing. And finally, Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So there, Paul says we need to actually be thinking about doing this, and he actually ties it in with getting together. Because it's really difficult to exhort somebody if you're not at church. If you're not regularly getting together with the body, it's really tough to get in and have a one-to-one. -one or even know what's going on. If you have the spiritual gift, all that means is, is that's your particular job in the body. You have that above every, where everybody is supposed to be doing it. That's your job. That's something you're supposed to be doing, and God has specially gifted you to really take it to another, a whole other level. So really, what we see about exhorting is that this is to be, well, yeah, it's for all of us to be doing, before I move on. All those verses that we just read is exhortation is something that you're to be doing. How comfortable are you with exhorting? Well, I don't want to say anything. <laughs> How comfortable are you with being exhorted? Not good at all. Why? Because it's usually because I didn't do something. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's back to the Proverbs. You know, all of them say, you know, wise is the man that listens to counsel. Yeah. It really comes down to a, it comes down to that, that old same pride. basic pride. Yeah. I don't want you I telling me. me. You're not <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're not. Not the boss, me. Not the boss. But what's the basis underlying that we've also seen already in exhortation? What's it come out of? What was those two great commands that Jesus gave? Love you. Absolutely. If I love you enough, then I'm going to be doing this. It's a job for all of us to be involved in. Like Pastor says, if you love someone, you, you tell them the bridge is out. Absolutely. You don't, you don't say, well, yeah, they'll figure it out. <laughs> I'm sure they got good brakes on that car. This is to be a regular, in fact, is even a daily activity. Hebrews 3.13. But it's all one another each day, as long as, as, long as, it, as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. How often? Day after day. Ah! I'm to be exhorting some the people I love on a daily basis? Oh, come on. The second half of that verse, though, so that you will not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That's that old, you do it once, and then it gets easier and easier and easier. Right. So if somebody's not confronting you, you're in trouble. Or you're not getting in and trying to help a brother or a sister along as well, saying, eh. You're getting in. Also. Yes. So there actually is a return. And I, next point. There is actually a return on this effort because it's also forcing you to do be doing what? Same thing. Absolutely. And that means you've got to be in the Word. That means you've got to have a good relationship. You've got to be loving the Lord your God with your heart, strength, mind. All of that. All of that comes into play here. And so there, there's a return investment on all of this. And I'm going to, I hope everybody is, I'm warm and I see people fanning themselves. I'm going to kick it down just a touch. Um, so let me give you some categories of who should be doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. First off, close friends. This is the easiest one. Close friends in the church should exhort and counsel one another. 
If your close friend can't do it, who can? The fact is, I think that's kind of the definition of a close friend. There's somebody that can come up and say, hey, come on, we got to be doing this. They should admonish each other of their faults, but they should also aid each other in growing in their spiritual life. And this is a back and forth thing with the idea that it's for the improvement and strengthening of each other, which we just saw. So exhortation is just not me coming in and, and telling Juanita, Juanita is what you need to be doing. This is for, we both get strength out of this. We both end up helping each other. We both, and the entire body gets stronger and moves together. All too often though, we want it to be this one way street. Well, I, I'm going to tell you, you know, what, what you're doing wrong. <laughs> but it's not a one-way, it can't ever be a one-way street. Again, we, Scripture uses the, the picture of the body. Do you we see anything in the body going one direction and that's it? Everything is a circulation. Everything moves. Everything goes through and comes back again. And that's the same thing that has to be happening here. But I think the easiest one and the best one that we could start with, because this is kind of an exhortation Sunday school lesson really on exhortation, is let's start with our close friends. Let's start at the easiest level. Parents should do the same thing with their children. Should be doing the same thing with their children. Which is great. And, and, yeah, and I didn't put an age thing until they're, you know, 18 or until they move out of the house. No, it's forever. Forever. Uh, because you're always older than they are. You've always experienced things they haven't learned yet or done. All of that. All of that. <laughs> of course, children have been particularly placed under your watch and care when they're still in your home. But even at that, God has set up this idea of family to be a care and a nurturing thing that extends as long as people are drawing breath. A pastor or a Sunday school teacher cannot regularly see all of the members of his church or class in private for exhortation. There's just simply too many of them. There's not enough time. So Christian parents are to be watching over the members of their families who are connected with the church so that they can aid in the overall growth of their family and of the church as a whole. Again, I'm starting with the easy relationships or the, the most connected. The third one, and this is where a lot of people want to default to, is Sunday school teachers may also assist, and that's why I have you filling that out and why it's in red. <laughs> Sunday school teachers can assist in this area. They are not the default exhortation people for your family. You are. But way too many parents have said, well, I'm just going to take them and there, and the Sunday school teacher will teach them all about everything about God. Or whatever. Or whatever. Come so they don't know what to read. <laughs> Sunday school teachers are to be assistants to parents and to pastors, but in a very secondary role. They often both have the youthful in age and often and also times the youthful in Christian maturity members of the churches in their care as Sunday school teachers. But they have an opportunity of knowing their class members' state of mind, their temptations, and their dangers a lot of times better than the pastor can. Because the pastor has his entire group, whereas the Sunday school teacher, be it a kid or an adult class, oftentimes has a smaller group so they're even more connected. But again, their kind of role is in an assistant role to the friends and the family coming in. It's, it's a teacher's responsibility, therefore, to exhort those in their influence to holy life. 
So a Sunday school teacher still has this big responsibility to be exhorting their class towards that holy life. To, and what's the definition of exhortation? What, what are we, what's, what's supposed to happen? An action. An action. But they're in a secondary role. But then again, if you get into scripture, you also find out what, how, what level God holds teachers to do and pastors. It's scary. For this class, I included this one. The aged should exhort the young. What I have always said is that God has a phenomenal, phenomenal, incredible retirement plan. It's just not here. And oftentimes the elders of our churches who are no longer maybe super active as Sunday school teachers or whatnot, they're just, <coughs> well, what am I supposed to do? Here you go. The age should exhort the young for some of those reasons that we brought up with, with parents as well. You have been around the block a couple of times. You can recognize the pitfalls because you probably have fallen into them and God has lifted you back out of that. So you should be exhorting the young. You, this is one of the jobs of the elderly in a church. This is what you are to be doing. For those of you that are the older members of our church, if you're not doing this, you're missing out on your job. There are young people floundering because our elders are not exhorting. What does that imply, though? Can you just walk up to, you know, a 17-year-old that you've never talked to before and begin to exhort them? No. No. So what's... <laughs> That's what, it, that's what it implies. There has to be a relationship there. Which is a good reason, just plugging in, for you to volunteer in Awanas in Bible school, because then as those kids grow, then you know them, you know, and you... And you have a relationship. Yeah, yeah. I still hold, um, I just lost her name. Just... Agnes. Agnes, thank you. She never quit! Finally, in Awana, she was just the hugger. <laughs> and the kids loved her. They lined up for their weekly hug by Miss Agnes. Because somebody loved them. That's what the elderly should be doing at Levine Baptist Church, is exhorting the young, but it implies a relationship. Physically older Christians can do a lot for the promotion of the faith in a body of believers. Your experience is the property of the church. The church owns your experience. But I don't say Levine Baptist, I mean the church. Because God has taken you through those experiences. And you are really required to employ it by helping the spiritually weak. By finding and directing the believer who is wandering. By bringing the backslider back and directing the questioning to the right answers or at least where they can find it. Because God has given you the time on this planet to be able to do that. There is a huge amount of spiritual capital of this kind locked up in the church that is completely unemployed and that might be made eminently more useful in helping others in their walk in holiness. And then finally, church members. So I've started in with friends and now I've broadened it out. Church members should exhort one another. There may not be the intimacy of personal friendship like with the very first one I gave you amongst all members of a large church or even a medium-sized church like Levine Baptist. But still the connection between us as believers should be regarded as sufficiently tender and confidential 
to make it proper for anyone to admonish a brother who is going the wrong way. Again, if we're doing it in love. If our idea is to help and bring a struggling brother back. Not to go. <laughs> because they belong to the same body of believers. They sit down at the same Lord's Supper. They've expressed agreements to the same articles of faith. They are regarded by the community as united with us. So why would we not be exhorting other members of the body? Each member of our church holds up a portion of the honor and the responsibility of the whole. Everything you do out there reflects on the mission and the view of the community about Levine Baptist Church. And if I'm doing something that is hurting the mission and the community's view of Levine Baptist Church, I darn well expect one of you to come up and tell me. Each member should feel that he has a right or that she has a right and that it is their duty to admonish a brother if they go astray. But by the same token, each member should be willing to be on the receiving end of when I'm not doing it correctly. So, so far we've kind of defined exhortation. We've seen who should be involved in it and who should be involved in it. Everyone. And how often? All the time. <laughs> Every day. So, now you're saying, all right, how do I do this? I want to do, I, I want to do this. I've seen the scripture. You, you showed me God's word. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm there. How do I go about doing this? First off is in season and out of season. John Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople in the late 300s, one of the early church fathers and a, just a great church writer. If you could read the writings of, of Chrysostom, he's a brilliant man, brilliant man. He wrote this, for thy work, set apart no definite and fixed hours, no appointment times. Thy work must be done at all hours, at all times. Thy work has to be done not only when thou art in church, not merely in times of security and peace, but it must be carried on in the midst of dangers, even that if thou art a prisoner and in change, even if death threatens thee. Chrysostom took it down to the brass tacks. He said, it doesn't matter. It's in season or out of season. You would think that if I'm in danger or if I'm in prison and in chains, okay, maybe now's not the time to be exhorting my brother. I've got other things to worry about. And Chrysostom said, no. In season and out of season. We should be doing this because I love my neighbor as myself daily, no matter what the circumstances are that surround me. You don't have a, Christotum said, you don't have a circumstance excuse. So not just when it's comfortable or convenient for you, this is about helping someone else and neither the clock nor the calendar is the deciding factor. Ouch. Because we use clocks and calendars to decide almost everything, do we not? Yeah. Is this... Some of us more than others. <laughs> is this convenient to me right now? The fun thing about being a, a, a chaplain and a, and, and a pastor at a church is that you very quickly learn that the clock and the calendar have no basis on your life at all. <laughs> now you can rail against it you can complain against it you can, but rejoice, rejoice. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so
So the first point is in season and out of season. The second thing that we end, in fact, is so, 1 Timothy 4 2. I, I, I've skipped over that. I want to go back and pick that up. Or 2 Timothy 4 2, excuse me. Preach the word of God, be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Yeah, so that was an in season, out season, but then it said to patiently teach, mm -hmm. patiently rebuke. So the next one is completely patient teaching. Completely patient teaching. If scripture tells us that we have to do this with complete patience, what does that imply? It's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. If I have to do this with patience, I'm not just going to walk up and say, uh, Steve, Steve, you messed yes. up here. And Steve's going to say, oh, thank you, Pastor Harry. I've completely changed my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He might. He might. Steve <laughs> might. <laughs> but if Scripture says to do it with complete patience, that the implication there is that this might darn well take some time. You're going to have to continue to love this person and continue to have a relationship and continue to exhort. Parents, does this sound familiar? <laughs> the Bible, however, praises patience as a fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, which should be produced for all followers of Christ. And it's not fruits of the Spirit. There is no S. It is fruit and that the fruit has all of those different aspects to it. It's one fruit. It's not, okay, patience is one fruit. And it's, a, it's one fruit. It's one thing. And then those are all aspects of it. Patience is one of them. Patience reveals our faith in God's timing, his omnipotence, and his love. Because if I'm being patient in my teaching, continuing to work with somebody who doesn't listen, who isn't suddenly seen, oh, thank you, I have this light bulb that came over my head, cartoon land, boom, and now I'm going to do this brand new thing, or I'm going to stop doing this thing, and that says I'm going to be patiently continuing on. And I'm going to be relying on God's timing. That's why I can be patient. On God's omnipotence. God has the power. He has all power. It's going to happen. And God's love. It's his doing. It's his action. It's his work. <clears throat> Although most people consider patience to be this passive waiting or gentle tolerance... When you go back in and look at that, and I spent a long time on this, it's not going to show up in the Sunday school lesson. But the Greek terms for patience are not this passive waiting or just gentle tolerance. They are extremely active, very robust words. Consider Hebrews 12.1. Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Run with, with patience. Yes. Does that sound like patience is this quiet, sitting back, just all very benignly waiting? You can't run with patience. Running is active. It takes everything you've got. Does one run a race by passively waiting for slow pokes? Or gently tolerating cheaters? No. The word translated patience in this verse means endurance. Same word for patience that we have translated patience, is endurance. I'm putting everything I've got, but I'm not quitting. 
A number of the, I, I'm gonna brag a little bit here. Until I got too old and realized, okay, I'm not gonna do this anymore. I had a 100% foot pursuit catch rate. If you ran and I chased you, I was gonna catch you. And a lot of times, it only be, it got down to, I refused to quit. I'm, if you're gonna keep running, I'm gonna keep running. One of the two of us is dropping dead before I quit. And invariably, the bad guy would just say, okay, I've had enough. <laughs> and there was a couple of times where I was going, okay, I, I guess I'm going to finally lose this one. And then, of course, every once in a while, my pride would come up and I would grab some, you know, 19-year-old and go, this 42-year-old man just ran your 19-year-old to the ground. <laughs> ah! And then I realized, wait, that wasn't right. That was a pride thing. But it's running with endurance. That's where the patience is. This is an active, this is a robust, this is a something I'm going to continue to do. A Christian runs the race patiently by persevering through difficulties and that person not coming to and doing the action that you were trying to exhort them to do. That's what patience is. Changes the whole idea of patience, doesn't it? I'm not just going to sit back in my chair and wait for God to do something. I'm going to patiently endure. I'm going to keep going. 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 And something's going to happen, but I'm going to keep going. That's patience. Changes the idea of patience. Throws it completely on its head for most of us. In the Bible, patience is persevering towards a goal, enduring trials, or expectantly waiting for a promise to be fulfilled. Here's the fun thing about patience, though. Patience doesn't develop overnight. I wish there was a patience pill. And if you want to see God fulfill a request, pray for patience. He's waiting to hear that out of your mouth. And I guarantee you, he will be all about make, teaching you how to be patient the way he defines patience. Not sitting around on your backside waiting for something to happen, but by enduring and continuing no matter what the obstacles are. See, God's power and goodness are crucial to the development of patience. Colossians 1.11 Colossians 1.11 tells us that we are strengthened by him to, and James 1, 3, and 4 to great endurance and patience. That's how we're strengthened, to great endurance and patience. It, James 1, 3, and 4 also encourages us to know that trials are his way of perfecting our patience. That's one of the objects of trials in our lives. Is I'm going, God says, I'm going to improve your patience anymore. I'm going to improve your endurance. Because the next thing that comes up, you're going to need that strength. In getting ready for Romania, I've been out walking, trying to get make sure that, because I said, if something goes sideways, I want to make sure that I can, <laughs> I've got the legs underneath me to, get myself back out of it. So I've been walking a couple of miles. Now it's getting a whole lot easier. I'm, I'm a little more than two miles from my house to the church, so a lot of mornings I've been walking to church. I live up behind the Fry's, up by the old golf course that used to exist there. It takes me about 35 minutes to get door to door, from my door to the office door. Walking down 51st Avenue. That's what the trial is. I'm going to build. But I tell you, when I first was going, this little tendon back here behind my knee was saying, um, um, do we have to do this again today? And my little app on my phone that says, hey, you've walked 5,275 steps today. You've walked a lot more this week than last week. You're walking a lot more this month than last month. 
you're walking a lot more this year than last year. <laughs> yeah, I know. And the tendons in the back of my knee were telling me the same thing. But this last couple of days that I've walked here, that's patience. That's patience. That redefines our idea of patience. Our patience is, like I said, is further developed and strengthened by resting in God's perfect will and timing. Psalm 37, 7 says this, Even in the face of evil men who succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes, that I'm going to be patient even in the face of evil men who succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. Because what else does Scripture tell me? How, often, how long are they going to succeed? Forever? No. It's temporary. Just a season. Just a season. It seems like it. Why are these evil guys... Um, why are these evil guys winning? And God says, you know what? Be patient. Rest in me. Let them win this battle. Rest, yeah, yeah, rest in me. But of course, be patient. And we've seen that patient isn't me just sitting on my chair, on my iPad, waiting for God to do something. It's me being active and doing stuff and getting trained and being involved and taking season, in season and out of season, answering the phone when it rings, going out at whatever hour, answering somebody's question on the phone at 10 o'clock at night because they had a question at 10 o'clock at night. That could have waited till morning. That could have. <laughs> but it was on their head right now. And being going and persevering no matter what. That's patience. And then said, I exhort him, I'm patiently teaching. Am I expecting an immediate result when I, when I get the occasion to preach of watching the entire audience go, ah, and walking out and being completely, utterly changed for the rest of their lives? Nope. That's why we have service again the next Sunday. <laughs> and we do it again. And we do it again. We do it again. And You see the flaws. I see the flaws. Yeah. I, I, this one woman says um, she's having a hard time finding a place to live, but she's staying with a friend right now. And she's talking about her uncle, and he has a big house. He has a big garage. I have some of her stuff in my garage because this uncle who has a huge garage, which has nothing in it, well, I mean, you could put a semi truck in there. Uh, she, he won't allow her to put her stuff, any of her stuff in there, so she's paying for storage, which has really gone up in price. <clears throat> and so he has switched his family aside, but he has, what you say, is successful. You know, successful. By the world's, yeah, the world's definition. <laughs> right, and, but you, you can still see in the world that some of these successful people have the flaws. Oh, yeah. They're not at every level successful. Yeah. 
and, and that's a big thing is redefining what success looks like, too. Um, our patience is rewarded, again, we've kind of redefined patience a little bit here, but our patience is rewarded in the end because the Lord's coming is near, James 5, 7, and 8. I'm enduring because I know that the Lord's coming is near. And the Lord is near to us in our patience because we're relying on Him. We're not doing it on our own. Yes, we're doing it in the Lord's strength, not on my own. Absolutely. Let me finish with this on this whole idea of exhortation. And these are three things that everything every Christian should be doing. First one is exhorting. Now let me do a, I got, I'm actually a little ahead of time for a change. Let me do a quick review. First off, what is exhorting? Right. It's, we're doing something that could get somebody to do an action. Stop doing something, start doing something. Absolutely. How often are we supposed to be doing it? All the time. If I'm exhorting somebody, what's the implication there? That I love them? And that there's some sort of a relationship. Even if it's, remember I went from very close, from close friends to the entire church body. And the church body, we're, well, I may not be, you know, we may not be going to dinner all the time or whatnot or exchanging birthday cards. I still should have somewhat of a closeness simply because we all are serving the same Lord. We sit down at the same Lord's Supper together. We, we commit to the same statements of faith. And how quickly is this going to happen? Over time. Over time. Because the idea of patiently teaching. So let me close with this verse out of Lamentations 3.25. And this is my exhortation, my encouragement, which is the third of these threes we're going to look at in two weeks. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks Him. Lamentations 3.25. So if I'm seeking Him, the Lord is good. Of course, the Lord is good all the time. Sure. But especially so, and, and I say especially so in that experientially is especially so. Because the Lord doesn't become any more good simply because I'm seeking. He's already completely good. But my experience is that the Lord is, that I, I see his goodness even more when I'm seeking him. And now, which is that first commandment, is it not? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, heart soul, and mind. mind, and then love your neighbors yourself. And I'm going to do that with patient, exhorting to an action. I'm going to be receiving exhortation from others in the body with the entire idea that the entire body here at Levine Baptist Church grows and becomes even stronger because the next step is I'm going to take this outside of the church to my neighbors who don't know anything about the rest of this. What kind of a difference would that make? In your workplace, in your neighborhood, at your friends group, if this was going on. Exhortation. One of the three things that every, every Christian should be doing. Dan, would you close us? Great, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lessons that you've given to uh, our pastor and teacher, Harry, here this morning, Father. Teach us and remind us to exhort one another. Not out of our own ambition or agenda, but out of yours, Father, to love. To fulfill those two great commandments, to love you and to love our neighbors. Father, we thank you for that. 
We ask you to impart these words into our hearts and, and take them as actions into our communities, into our church, Father, and to love each other as you command. So that people will know that we are your disciples. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Next week, and if you want to look up definitions whatnot ahead of time, we're going to look at the word edify. And in my household, that's actually a term that got used a lot. Ask any of my kids when you see them, how often did you hear the word edify? A lot. We'll see you next week.